Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to day two of our introduction into medical research. Hope you are all well. And today's topic is writing and refining research papers. In case we have any new viewers today, I'm Mariam Hamam, a second year medical student at the University of Health Sciences. And today I will have the pleasure of introducing and, pre and presenting more accurately Omar Al Omari. Omar Al Omari is a highly accomplished fourth year medical student at the University of Health Sciences. Notably, he has contributed to significant publications, including why vaccinations should be a top priority in earthquake relief efforts and advances in CRISPR Cas9 for the baculovirus vector system, a systematic review. Beyond his research work as a fourth year medical student, Omar Al Omari holds the esteemed title of Cochrane Verified Systematic Reviewer and Meta Analyzer. Omar, welcome. The screen is yours. We are happy to have you here. Thank you, Mariam, for the warm introduction. Uh, again, hello, everybody. My name is Omar Al Omari. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Health Sciences. I've been doing medical research uh, since 2021. And today, I'm here to share my knowledge and experience in this file. First of all, I would like to emphasize, uh, uh, Mariam, do you see my screen? Yes, we do, Omar. You can continue. OK, C could you control the slides? Um, Are they moving? Can you try moving them, please? Yes, they are moving. No worries. So uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, it's not um, possible to uh, cover this wide topics in just one or two hours. OK, so our aims here is to put you in the right way to tell you how to start and uh, recommend some uh, resources for you. After that, you can make your own progress. OK, so please pay attention. Ask as much as you want from questions. I will be happy to answer all of your questions. Uh, with Turkish or uh, English. Uh, I also would like to thank Neuromer for uh, this opportunity and let's start together. Uh, I will uh, explain the agenda here firstly. My presentation consists of three sections. The first section will, we will talk about how to collect and analyze the data. This is the most important section of my presentation. Also, we will talk about uh, how to revise uh, the paper after you write it. And in the end, we will talk about how to uh, pick a journal, how to publish in a journal. Uh, so this is a publication process, which is the most exciting uh, phase of the uh, of the medical research, especially if, uh, if you are doing this for the first time. And I will end up with a question and answer section. Uh, so th th there will be a lot of time for questions. So don't don't uh, do not hesitate to ask whatever you want. So this is the first section, which is the most important section in this in my presentation. Uh, take a look at the subtitles. We will cover them one by one. So let's start with the quantitative and qualitative research methods. Actually, this is a so uh, this is a very complicated topic, quantitative uh, or qualitative. Okay. I'm not gonna go through the theoretical uh, uh, explanations of this topic, but all I need you to know is here. Let me get my pointer. Anyway, okay. So here, the first thing you uh, from uh, you have to take care of it is that quantitative research is measuring and testing. So there is numbers there, there is a cut of values there. Also, there is statistical analysis there. So this is the most important thing you have to take care of it while you are dealing with the quantitative research. In the qualitative research. It's just observing and interacting. Okay, so uh, the evidence, the, the modern evidence-based medicine are always based on the quantitative re uh, medical research. Okay, but there is something like, there is uh, a special kind of qualitative research, like the interviews, uh, interviews with a uh, very, very experienced uh, professor, etc. So the only difference you have to take care in this stage is that in quantitative medical research we are measuring and testing we have a statistical analysis there so your data is verified but here in the qualitative research we are observing and interrupting and at the end we will end up with a hypothesis and we will need a quantitative research to approve this hypothesis okay 
So in the quantitative research, I have the hypothesis in the beginning, and I'm trying to approve it by statistical, statistical analysis. But in the qualitative research, I have ideas, and I want to reach to a specific hypothesis. Okay, be, just all you have to know is these two main difference. Uh, during my uh, whole research journey, I'm just getting involved in one qualitative research. Uh, it was between our university and uh, Sheffield University from England. And I recommend University of Health Sciences students to, to, uh, to get involved in this type of research. It's a very great experience, actually. You can go to Pei, uh, Perihan Hoja and ask him to be involved in this team. Uh, every year, they bring uh, the, the, our school brings two students from the Sheffield University, so you can join the team and learn from them how to conduct a qualitative medical research. So now let's talk about the data collection and how we can collect data nowadays. So this is the most important phase of your re, uh, of your research. Okay, Wh whatever your uh, study design, you have to take care of this phase. Otherwise, you will end up with non-statistically significant results. Okay, so you have this space should be carefully reviewed. And me as Omar, before starting every uh, before starting any research, I ask myself this, these three questions. Always. The first question is, how I'm going to collect this data? So there are lots of available methods now. Okay. So how I'm going to collect this data, it depends on how this data will be analyzed. So you have to understand the method first. I'm so, sorry, I'm so sorry, Omar, but your slides are not moving. Not moving? Now it just came. Okay, here. let's just keep going from here. Okay. So the first question, as we said, you have to ask yourself how this data, what is the available method that I will be used in this research? So how will data be analyzed? The second question will be how you will collect this data. Okay, so you have to ask yourself how I'm going to collect this data. What is the available method that I'm going to use? And the last question is, what information are you going to collect? You have to be specific as much as you can. Okay, just telling that I need the data of patients from 2021 to 2022. This is not enough. The doctors in the hospital don't have time to deal with this much of data. So you, you have to be specific so as much as you can, so they will be able to help you. And here you can, uh, I, I've uh, provided you here with the most, uh, most used uh, data collection approach nowadays. There are other than this, but you can, all you have to know for now, all this, the questionnaire survey data for the indexes, clinical trials, or uh, cross-sectional studies. There is also the most important uh, resources for data now is the hospital records or any health facility records. You have uh, for the qualitative data, like interviews, focus groups, phone records during the interview, or you can also take care of uh, 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 recorded data. In, in Istanbul, Ankara, and Izmir, all the hospitals now are provided with devices that can record the data of the patient. Like if you go to, uh, to, to, uh, to, Istanbul, uh, to hospital in Istanbul and ask for a specific device, and the data that's recorded in this specific device and you get the proper ethical uh, approval, you, you may get the data. All the uh, modern devices now are recording the data nowadays. And uh, again, I want to emphasize the importance of collecting a good and valid data. You know, you have done everything correctly, but you have some concerns or biased data here in this space, you will end up with non-significant results. Okay, so if you've done this space, if you do this space, great and without any mistakes you will your article will get published in a very high yield journals so you have to maintain the integrity of your research by getting a good and valid data also you should keep the records of your uh, or, or the, the data records that you have uh, that you have uh, created during the uh, during the collection process the editor or the reviewers of the journal will ask you to provide them. Sometimes they may ask you to provide them with these databases. So you have to maintain this data properly and you have to keep your data valid by doing the everything step by step correctly. So now I've done with this. Let's talk about the importance of importance of biostatistics. Actually, before 2008, the most valuable resource was the experience of a doctor. Okay, so if the doctor is a professor, have a, a great 
uh, experience with the 40 years, what is the, what, what this doctor says is the most reliable source, most valid source. But after 2008, Cochrane has established the evidence-based medicine system. Okay, and this system is based on statistical number, and this system is based on the valid data. So, even let's let me give you an example. Let's say you are a second-year medical student. You have conducted a meta-analysis regarding the multiple sclerosis treatment, and you you have con uh, concluded that the patients who use uh, the patients who use uh, multiple uh, multiple sclerosis treatment are more prone to infections okay and there are an expert uh, a professor who has a very uh, very long experience in, in in multiple sclerosis and he said the opposite of what you have said that uh, he, he he have said that you uh, the the treatment of multiple sclerosis doesn't cause uh, uh, doesn't make the patient more uh, prone to infection so in the new system your meta analysis or your systematic review the the the, the results you have got than this professor expert opinion uh, this uh, professor opinion okay so in nowadays we as medical students we can uh, make a progress in in the evidence-based medicine okay even we don't have that much of knowledge even we don't have th that experience because there is uh, maybe we can lie maybe we don't know but the the numbers cannot lie okay so this is the importance of biostatistics in nowadays here we can take a look uh, at the at the studies that now it's most valid and most most uh, most properly used as study designs. Here in the uh, in the bottom you can see, as I said, expert opinion, and here there is a background information, and you have to go step by step. I've started it from here, guys, and I, I'm now a meta analyzer. I didn't just doing a randomized controlled trials, but I've done all of these studies. So. You have to start with background information and this is only done by reading too much you have to uh, start reading articles as much as you can by starting the article by starting starting reading the article you may get knowledge or you may get uh, an enough background regarding the methods that we have nowadays that we, that is used for base statistics for for getting uh, the immunohistochemical method etc et you will get maybe the first five to six articles will be so difficult for you especially the method section okay but after that you will your your eye will get used to it your brain will get used to it and after that you will start to to get the ability to create a hypothesis okay so to create a healthy hypothesis first you have to know what we can do what is the capacity capacity of our method methodology now okay so uh, after that we here, here we have case reports all of you will go to hospital and you will see some unusual uh, uh, cases so you have to report these cases to uh, or especially for the rare diseases you can report these cases to the literature you have to report it actually okay case series it's like let's say you have a five uh, unusual uh, case report so you have to you can report them as a, as a case series here we have a case control studies these two these two studies need uh, needs a, a long follow up period okay especially case control and the uh, clinical trials needs a lot a, a very long uh, uh, follow up period so you may not be able to join uh, as a student in this time but as a systematic review and meta analysis all you need is your laptop okay these types of studies needs what needs uh, funding need uh, financial support and it's very difficult to get here in middle east so your only variable your only valuable choice is systematic reviews and meta analysis okay so you can you have to take care of this learn this if you can and you are in the top of the pyramid if you learn uh, this, uh, this especially if you are thinking about going to abroad for the us or etc you have to know how to make a meta analysis so uh, so i guess you get a, a short background regarding how the bio statistics is important okay so you have to know if especially if you are uh, if you are good at statics statistics i recommend you to take the required uh, courses and start to develop your career at, with the bio statistics uh, i i'm doing uh, i'm reviewing lots of articles for journals now especially for medicine journal the first thing they are asking us to uh, as a reviewer okay to check in the paper was the statistic uh, was the bio statistics of the article has done uh, uh, right or not Okay, so you have to, if you learn the base statistics, 
you will get a higher chance to be involved in a, a very high number of uh, research, especially here in Turkey. And I know that uh, some uh, uh, some journals like uh, Lancet, uh, JAMA, BMG, Nature, they do not accepting that another person or a, a person who are not a doctor to interrupting the data. You know, uh, people here in Middle East, how, uh, how they do this, they just asking a statistician to make the base statistics of the uh, of the uh, of the collected data. This is wrong. This is not accepted in the high yield journals. So they they ask to uh, a person who is a doctor to make the base statistics uh, tests for this uh, for, for the for the study. So if you, I, I will recommend a course now. So if you have the time, just join the course and uh, try to uh, to learn as much as you can. Okay. And I've put an, 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 an article here. I recommend you to read it. It's uh, emphasizing the importance of base statistician in medical research. So you can read the article. I will send the, the presentation to you also after the, after the webinar. So the, the course is, uh, is free, provided by Coursera. Just, I, I've started the base statistics from this course. Just go and uh, search introduction to statics and go with the first course, which is the Stan, uh, Stanford University course, introduction to statics. This course is very great. It's uh, recommended for the beginner level, and you it will go with you step by step. After you're done with this course, you you may choose to go with further uh, base statistics. Okay, so you will be the base statistician of the studies in here in, in in while you are a student, or you can just get the background information so you can create hypotheses. Okay, and. If you are the base, statisti base statistician of the study, you have the right to be the third author. You have the right to be the third author in the article. You know, when, when there are five or six persons in the same article, the third name always given to the base, statistic base statistician. Okay, so this is a very good advantage for you. you. All you have to do is like working for eight hours in maximum to, to interrupt the, the, the data. Now let's do, let's take a look about the most common ways to present data. There are actually lots of way, ways to, co to present your data, but the most used, the most accepted by the whole journal are tables, charts, and the graphs. And to create, to create these graphs, charts, and tables, all you need to do is to learn one of these programs, okay? These programs, guys, are very important nowadays, and I recommend all of you to learn at least two of them. I'm gonna go with Excel. Excel is important. It's good. You, it all I, I'm pretty sure that most of you have a great background with Excel, but you have to get the statistical and uh, uh, algebra issues with Excel. You have to uh, get a, an enough background with them. Actually, you have here a graph by the prism. A graph by the prism is a great also uh, software for creating charts, especially, and it's more easier uh, to use than these two guys. The SPSS most used one. It's for the statistics, and also it will give you the charts and tables after you've done your uh, data analysis process. And the last one is the R. R actually is a coding language, like Python. So you have to get an enough uh, uh, coding background to deal with the R. R is the most requested software data analyzing now in nowadays. Okay, so if you know the R, you will get a great chance to be involved in, in, in a very high number of medical research, especially here in Turkey. Let's take a look at how can I now how can I create a, a, a reason conclusions. This is not the same as the conclusion in the last of the paper. This is uh, that conclusion is like one part of these conclusions. While you are writing your result section in the paper, okay, you have to interrupt the data while you are writing them, especially in the results and discussion section. You have to compare your results with the literature also in the discussion. So while you are doing this, you have to make conclusions. To, to make sure that the reader of your article get the most important, all the major points of you, what you are trying to say. So you have to not exaggerate your data, your results. You cannot say, okay, this drug treats this disease. This is not easy, especially due to the heterogeneity of our uh, patients. Each patient in nowadays has a different properties from the others. So it's not easy to make a, generali a generality while you are saying your conclusion. So how can you avoid, or how can you evaluate the certainty of your results? Let's say you get a result, and you now you want to say the conclusion of your results. 
So is it easy to say, it's not easy to get how much I can say my results are positive or negative, okay? So there is, uh, and the main reason of that, you know, the editor will get your article and will send it to a different reviewers, okay? And these reviewers will evaluate, these reviewers are experts in this field. So they know all the drugs in the, in the, for this disease or you know all the, all the new developments in this field. So you cannot lie there. You cannot say this drug 100% treat this disease. This, this is not uh, possible. Okay. So you have to, to, how can I make a well-reasoned conclusion and how can I assess the certainty of my results? So Cochrane has created as a, a tool called the GREAT tool. You can use this tool. There are lots of tools. Oh, especially if you have uh, if you have done uh, an enough uh, reading or you have an enough background with an enough uh, clinical sense you have done your uh, clinical rotation and you have clinical sense you have an, enough information you don't need these tools you can write according to your experience or past experience but if you don't know or if you still have some uh, if you are still suspected so you have to use a great assessment which is we will discuss in the next slide here. The great assessment is a tool. You will uh, you will fill some scores there in the in, 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 in the website. The first score is regarding the heterogeneity. As I mentioned, that was your patient was the patient or was were all your patients as the same disease? So is there any huge heterogeneity in your data? This heterogeneity is determined by what? Determined by the heterogeneity is mostly determined by the uh, by the base statistics so the, there is a, a confidence interval and i'm not going to go through all of this but according to the confidence interval you will understand your heterogeneity and if you if your data is too much there is too much heterogeneity in your data you cannot say you cannot be that much sure about your decision the second one is the accuracy okay accuracy is so important how can uh, how you will evaluate the accuracy of you? you? You will go to method section. You can try it by getting an article from the literature and it, it, uh, training yourself with this uh, great assessment method. The, the first thing you're gonna take uh, you're gonna uh, uh, take care of it is the heterogeneity. The second one is the accuracy. Was there accurate as much as they they can? Okay. The second the third one is the directness. Sometimes uh, each study each study has a primary and secondary outcome. The primary outcome should be determined before you start your research. The primary outcome, sometimes the research, uh, the researcher did not get an enough uh, data from the primary outcome. It was non-significant and non-statistically significant. So they go to secondary outcomes and they try to write the results, the whole of the results from the secondary outcome. There, well, there is no place for the primary outcome. So in these cases, this article is not direct. You, this method is not direct. Let's give an example. Let's say that you have uh, you were trying to evaluate the, the 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 impact of deep brain stimulation on the uh, hypothalamus for the headache. Okay. After so your your primary outcome will be regarding the primary the the headache, the hypothalamus and also the deep brain stimulation was it effective or not this is you this is the primary outcome but let's say while while the researcher was doing this research uh, this um, re research they found that if we give a higher if we give it also to the frontal loop of a brain it will give an positive results this is a secondary uh, outcome you cannot interrupt the secondary outcome even if it's positive before the primary outcome if you do any any wrong thing in in reporting your data so you are there is an indirectness there okay this is not the same thing that you have mentioned in the uh, beginning of the study so if you have indirectness in your data you cannot say you cannot make a hundred percent conclusion and the last one is the bias i'm sure that you have heard about bias publication bias selection bias especially selecting the patients patients is not easy guys so bias will occur there is no uh, there is no, uh, you cannot uh, run away with this, but in the bias, you can, th that's why the p-value will give you a, some, a, 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 a small range to make a mistake. It's due to the bias. bias. Bias will occur whatever you do, but you have to evaluate the bias in your data. If the patients, if the most of your clinical trial, uh, the most of your patients 
uh, had died, you cannot say that this uh, this treatment is effective or not effective. Because almost all of them died. You can you you couldn't follow them enough to get the, an uh, uh, a well reasoned conclusion to get an uh, the enough data. So according to these four factors, okay, you will you you will get uh, uh, you will get your conclusion done. Okay. And the second part of uh, my uh, presentation will be regarding how to revise my paper. Let's take here are the subtitles. You can take a talk, take a look at them. And how to seek a feedback from mentor. The first thing to revise your paper is to let's say you finished right you 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 have just finished the writing. Send it to your mentor. Okay. And according to the comments of your mentor, you will make the first revision. This is so important. And now the mentor actually, especially here in the Middle East, there is a big issue regarding the mentors. So be careful while you are dealing with your mentor. You have to uh, you have to know how to handle uh, uh, other people. If you do, if you are not good at relationship with other people, so you have to first to, to know how to handle toxic people, especially. Okay. So in the choosing the right mentor is not easy. I'm still choosing my mentors. And we, as a medical students, we don't have that much of concerns regarding the mentor. Let's say you, you can work with different mentors at the same time. But in PhD or my, if you are a PhD or master's student, you don't have the right. So choosing the right mentor is not that big concern for you in this stage. So I recommend you to start working with doctors to learn how to choose mentor by according to your personality. I cannot explain to you how to choose the right mentor. You have a different personality than my personality. So you have to go through this process and you will get uh, in the end of this uh, of this process, you will be able to choose the right mentor. But if you are a PhD student or a master's student, you won't be able to do this. So take the chance from now, try to handle lots of doctors at the same time. And you can, you can after that, you will be able to choose which mentor are is uh, which type of people I, I can work with them. So after you send them the, uh, after you can say, after you send them the, your first draft of your manuscript, they will give you some, uh, some uh, comments. You will edit your paper regarding them. But let's say if your mentor is not helpful, she, he or she did not send you anything. So you have to revise it by yourself. So the first thing to do while you are revising your paper by yourself is to do it more than one time. Okay, iterative process. You have to do it at least three times. The first and doing, and you have to like focus on different aspects during each pass. This is, so let's say in the first pass you will take you take care of the language editing. In the second one you will take that you will make sure that I've reported all the data. So go one by one. It will at least it should be three times before you send your paper to, to the journal. And if you don't have enough English, okay, you may get benefit from professional editing services from the internet. It's available. Almost all of them paid, but you you still have some uh, some uh, free on, uh, online choices. Let's take a look at them. You can see uh, almost all of you know Grammarly. You can start with the Grammarly, but for the academic writing, Grammarly is not enough. Not that much uh, enough. You can use ChatGPT. I will come back to ChatGPT and tell you uh, something regarding it. Quillbot is also, you can use it free for a specific uh, range. It's a free. Perfected, it's uh, funded. Uh, it's a paid, sorry. Here you have see uh, these three things are resources. You can use, if you have time to read, read this three, these three resources, and you will get an enough background to write with uh, academic English. The academic English is not the same thing as the normal English. so make sure that you know which verbs to use while you are writing. Regarding ChatGPT, ChatGPT, you have to be specific with him. You cannot just telling him that, write me a discussion according to my results, giving him the results. This is not allowed. Even if allowed, the, the editor uh, nowadays, how we are doing as a reviewer, we are taking the discussion sec section, paste it to Ch ChatGPT, and we simply just ask, did you write this? And if you, you, if you have used ChatGPT, ChatGPT will say, yes, I write this for a, a few weeks ago or something like that. They will give you the period of time. So it's not uh, recommended to use ChatGPT just for editing. And if you use it for editing, 
you have to there is a statement now it's a new statement you have to to say that in the last of your manuscript okay you have to say that i have uh, this paper has been artificial intelligence assisted editing okay so you have to make a statement to telling that i've used an artificial intelligence in editing or assisting the language or the writing of my uh, of my paper almost now all of journals uh, uh, asking this statement if you have used or you have the, uh, or, or you you have did not use and now let's take a look at the uh, last part of uh, uh, of all my presentation which is the most exciting part especially if you if it's your first time you will be so excited to get your published uh, to your uh, paper published but it's not easy you will go through rejection several times then you will get it published and this is due to uh, uh, mental uh, actually preparing the manuscript for the publication is not easy because you know each uh, each paper or each uh, journal will need a specific reference styles so you have to go through references from the beginning to the end and you have to make to make sure that everything as the uh, guideline of authors that i am I'm, I'm pretty sure that betul have showed you it has showed you it uh, yesterday so it's not an easy process so the mentors always ask the students to uh, to make this to, to make the journal submission after so the 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 student always ask uh, all the, because the student don't know or the student doesn't know how which journal I will pick, it will go through several rejections before it get accepted. So let's take a look how I'm gonna pick journals. Actually, the journals uh, I wanna emphasize the difference between academic journals and magazine. It's not the same. In the journals here, you can say there is a lots of restriction. Not anyone can writing or uh, or posting there. There are lots of restrictions, lots of lots of uh, requirement for each uh, journal. So you have to be careful. It's a very easy process, but at the same time, you have to to know which journal I need, which journal is the most proper one for my paper, and how to uh, for doing this. We can just check. Uh, so these are the key aspects of every academic journal. Okay, and the first thing, and you you need to know what makes the, these journals different from the magazine. Here we have a, in, in academic journal, we have a peer review process. What, is, what, what, the, what does this mean? It means that after the editor gets your article, he, the editor will give this article to a different professors and doctors, reviewers, okay? From the same uh, area of interest of your paper. So this, uh, they will write, uh, they evaluate it from the beginning to the end, and they will write comments regarding your paper. And they will be asked to make the last decision. Their decision will be accept, reject, minor, minor revision, and major revision. They may, the, 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 the journal will ask you to make the requested uh, revisions, and you can, your article will may, maybe get uh, accepted again. So the first thing, you have to take care of it, the peer review process. So some journals still do not have a peer review process. So it's, they are like magazines. Don't submit your, pa your paper to a peer uh, to, to a journal who is not a, a peer review process. The second one is the types of journals. We have lots of types of journals according to the access models. We have an open access, we have a, sub, a, sub, a sub, sub, subscription based, and we have a hybrid. The open access, you have to pay, you have to pay to the journal to get your article published. In the subscription based, you don't have to pay, but the reader who want to get access to your article will pay money for your article. And the last one, we have a hybrid, which a which are uh, which is for the journal who has a mix a subscription base and open access at the same time. And during your submission, you will say you will select I need it to be published on open access or I need it to be published as a subscription based. So publication frequency actually. I, I, uh, some 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 journals do it weekly or monthly. So if you need your um, article to get published quickly, so you have to select such journal. But if you don't have any uh, problems with time, you have you, you may not c consider evaluating the article uh, in aspect of the publication frequency. I still have a uh, I have a paper I've submitted it in the last November November 2022, and it's still under review until today. It's almost like uh, it's uh, almost like ten months, and I'm still waiting. 
I'm sure that uh, Betul have already has already mentioned the Shimago website and how to get the impact factor and uh, the quarter. I'm not gonna go through this. And here we have a most important four criteria to evaluate the journal. The first one you have, let's say you have choose one journal and now you are already you want to submit your article to it. Before that, you have to check these four criteria. The first one is international or local. If it's an international journal, this is this this means that it's a very highly uh, it's a very high quality other than the local journals so local journals as in compared to the international journals it still have, uh, have uh, still have a, a lower quality the second one is the impact factor of the journal actually you can may, you may see the site score it's the same thing as the impact factor but uh, you may ask yourself what's the impact factor impact factor is the uh, a number given to the to the journal according to its impact in the society or in the in the field how it's calculated the impact factor is calculated by dividing the the number of citations number of citations uh, divided by the number of publications uh, among the last two years in the site score it's just the same thing but the last four years but the impact factor for just for last last two years so even there are lots of journals without impact factor but you you still can uh, publish there. But a, a journal with a high impact factor is still a better choice for you. The access, if you don't have money, you cannot uh, uh, publish in open access. By the way, open access, because you are uh, paying money, the evaluating process may be a kind of uh, a kind of lighter than the the closed or hybrid journal. And the last one is the indexing, which is a very important thing, especially in Turkey. Indexing is like each journal has its own index, a, a specific index. It may get one or two specific index. And according to the index, you will choose the journal, especially if you are uh, want to be an uh, associate professor here in Turkey, uh, docent, you, you should um, publish your paper in journal with a specific index. So I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to go through this, but you have to know that there is indexing also. This, these are not enough. So if you publish your article in, in the wrong index, you, you cannot put it in your uh, file of associated professor uh, uh, application. You, you cannot be the chance. Okay. And here, mm -hmm. so you have to make sure that the journal you choose align with the scope of your research. So let me explain it to you. Let's say you have done an, an, a research regarding the stroke. Okay. So stroke is uh, actually is associated with the different three branches of medicine the first one is hematology the second one is cardiology and the third one is the neurology so if you are if your research is regarding the uh, blood properties of the stroke patient you so you you may submit it to a hematology related journal but if you are dealing with the cardiac output during or after the stroke you have to submit it to cardiology. So this will be better. Actually, stroke is regarding to all of these three branches, but you have to know which journal will be most suitable for your research. And if you are looking like uh, the uh, neurological deficit after the uh, stroke, you will submit your article to neurology a related journal. So you have to know the aim and scope of your or the mission of the journal and the scope of your article and after that you will uh, you you will be able to get your article published with the most suitable uh, with the most suitable journal and here you can see uh, how to do it you have to under uh, this is a, a kind of repeating but and uh, you have identified your research focus as i mentioned after that databases for what for getting the index impact factor etc guideline authors you have also this is so important thing, especially in here in Middle East. You have to make sure that all the authors and mentor has accepted uh, have accepted the uh, the journal. So the, if you are able to get uh, a written constant uh, constant form, take it. Otherwise, you may feel with some ethical issues here. Take a look at the peer review process, as we say, publication fee if it's an open access, and you have to consider multiple options, guys. It's as I said, you will go through several rejections. After that, you will get uh, uh, your article will get accepted. And if you still, uh, after all of this uh, thing, you still you have some difficulties due, uh, while you are uh, picking the right journal for your research, you may use these tools, journal finder tools. Each big index or data, each big index or database is to, uh, have its own tool. Like Alsaver have a journal finder, 
all you have to do is copy and paste your abstract to the uh, to this tool and they will suggest the most the most suitable uh, uh, journal for you here i just want to warn you regarding the regarding the mdpi mdpi now is considered uh, is considered as a uh, as a predatory journal which means sensitive and open access journal they accepting article without review peer review process so be careful don't start with mdpi don't uh, make it as a last option for you to submit your article to any of mdpi journals and the others this is most important one this is also good this is also good all of them is good but mdpi have some conflict of interest uh, uh, issues so uh, until it's clear don't submit any of your papers to this journal and again this is a figure as we said index the impact factor of the journal that if it's on open access or not peer review process here you can use the tool uh, here you can just put your manuscript title manuscript uh, uh, your abstract text and after that you will get your uh, the, the most suitable journal for your uh, article and okay this is the end of my presentation thank you for listening uh, you can ask your questions uh, immediately no problem with me uh, how much question do you have no problem and also, uh, you can uh, you can deliver your questions through social media, emails, or LinkedIn. Also, we are uh, we have uh, something called uh, like you have you have we have a consultants agency here at uh, Omari Research. You can reach out uh, whenever you you have need for that, and we may help you to to get your research published or just to uh, refine your uh, research paper. Thank you again, guys. Is there any questions? Uh, do we have any questions? Personally, I have a question actually that I can ask. I think it would be of an interest. Um, assuming you found data more relevant for the secondary output, can you shift the focus of the study during the study or does it have to remain um a topic for a different study okay you can shift the the focus of your study it's not a problem but you have to make while you are doing your conclusions you cannot be that much certain okay because you have shifted the focus of your study according to the data this is called publication by it. okay you, you you shifted the focus from a primary outcome to to another outcome and this will give you what is called publication bias so this is not uh not a problem you can do it almost all of us doing it but you have to you cannot be certain during the discussion and conclusion part of your paper okay thank you go ahead hamza uh, hello 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 you we, we can hear you okay uh, I have just two questions. Uh, one question regarding the biostatistics. Uh, so which is better, the R uh, coding program or the SPSS? Okay, so without knowing, without knowing the SPSS, you cannot go ahead with the R. So first you have to start with the SPSS, most basic one, SPSS and Excel. After that, you may go to the R. R needs uh, some coding uh, background. If you get the coding background, you, you, you can, uh, it's, it's more comfortable to use R just writing the code and all the data will be interrupted according to your uh, the, the writing code so you have to, to know the P, the spss to be able to write the right comment right code for mm -hmm. the r yeah okay thank you uh, i have another question uh, yeah, my question is regarding the uh, finding for example uh, professors or doctors at my university to conduct a research with so uh, do i need just um, you know, do i need just to go to them and uh, tell them that i want to work with you or i need to find a, a topic or an idea then i can uh, tell them okay, uh, what let me, your opinion it regarding on, the this. Degree, on the degree of the doctor so what which qualification you have okay let's say you have a good english uh, uh, professors and doctors here in turkey are looking for a students with a good english to write to just write the paper so mm. you have to make as much as uh, qualifications you have to qualify yourself after that you have to find an interest of area let's say you cannot go to a cardiologist to to just work with an, an, an neurology uh, project okay so according to the 
your area of interest according to the qualifications you have, according to the also the degree of the doctor. If the doctor is a professor, it will not want to be work with, to work with you. It, actually, he's or she's has enough students to work with, uh, PhD and uh, uh, master students. So you have to prove yourself. You have to be highly qualified to be able to work with a people, a people with high with high uh, with high academic degree. Mm, okay, thank so you. So also, also don't go to the doctor or professor and ask for topics or ask for a study. They will not give you anything. You have to make your re own reading. After that, you can go and pick the mentor. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You are more welcome. Let's check the chat. Medina asks. Okay, actually, it depends on your personality. Yani, uh, let's say that you are able to handle toxic people, so you will work with lots of people. You will find a very uh, lots of mentors. But if you don't have the ability to work with to to handle people uh, who who are just always complaining of your work, okay, you you it will be difficult to find a suitable uh, mentor for you. So my recommend to you is to get or to ask a previous student who has or who has already worked with this mentor and ask the uh, ask the most thing that you have to take care of it like uh, is he so strict regarding the deadlines or etc after that you may make your decision otherwise it's so difficult Okay, Mohammed Abdullah asked the presenter said never to choose more than one mentor. Okay. Okay, it's actually um, there is no strict no strict rule that you 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 don't have the right to work with different mentors. As I said, you don't have to work with lots of mentors when you are a PhD or a master student. But nowadays here in in uh, while, while you are an MD student or you you still a student, you can work with. Uh, lots of mentors if you don't you know now we as students we did not specify our area of interest so, so I, i'm working everything right now i'm working with cardiology with neurology with with uh, oncology especially so i still didn't, don't know my specific area so how can I, my, I how can i restrict myself to just one area and one mentor so uh, it actually depends on you if you are okay with working with lots of people you have to work if you don't you don't work so there is no mistake with working with lots of people. Any other questions, guys? I guess there is a... I have a question. Yeah, go, Aya. Oh, yeah. um, so I was going to ask, like, since you made a research about the CRISPR-Cas9, um, it's been, like, a part of my interest for a while, but I never thought of... How do you go and actually start a research if you know like about a topic or how do you choose a topic to start a research? Okay, I would. Uh, the discussion yeah, part. Makes sense. Okay. The discussion part of each study, if it an meta analyzes or a systematic review or it's a primary study, the discussion part of the study has a very valuable hypothesis. You have to read the discussion carefully. In the discussion, these people, uh, these people may say that. Uh, the baculovirus system uh, has uh, it, it was a systematic review has been done in 2002 and they they wrote a note a, a small note the baculovirus system may have a future integration with the crispr cas9 so according to this uh, to this statement i we we as a team we have conducted a crispr cas9 uh, systematic review so how to start is just reading you have to read you have to read paper as much as you can just download them. I'm sure that you know how to download from Skyhub or from the literature itself. Download the papers. Read uh, one paper for one for each week from different areas, and you have to make sure that you know which branch or which doctors you have in your faculty, and which uh, which of these doctors uh, or, or who's of these doctors uh, working actively. Some of them, after being associ associate professor or professor, they stop working. Okay, but almost all of the others uh, keep working. So you have to know which of them working, which of them not. So according to the worker, you have or uh, you have to ma make your readings. And let's say you have found something interesting. You just take an appointment with your doctor and go to him and ask him for 
conducting even just just a, a systematic review. We don't ask the, for the primary study, etc. You can also go with Tubitac 20, uh, 20, 2209. So you can make a uh, very small budget for ELISA or for immunohistochemical chemical method or like for almost what, for what? Yeah, for these two things, you 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 may get uh, uh, an enough data. You might get enough enough money to get an enough data to publish uh, a study. So from where to start? It's almost like you have to read. You have to read. You have to know how what is the methodology we have, what we can do, what we cannot not, what is the gap. Uh, information gap in the literature and of uh, how I can fill this gap and all of these are mentioned in the discussions of the paper you can nothing uh, you can especially we are students we cannot create a, a new thing we, we, we do, still don't have that much of knowledge to to create a, 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 a healthy hypothesis null hypothesis so what we are doing is we are looking for what the other uh, what other uh, scientists or other students from the world are doing and we we try to do the same that's it but with our own way don't make copy paste if you make copy paste you will you will stay behind these people you will wait for them to take the step to so you are able to take this step no you just learn how to start after that you have to go with your own way if you are not okay with working with five mentors you don't have to wait just because i mentioned that Okay, I'm okay with working with one with one mentor. Go and do it with one mentor. So you have to know how to start. I'm telling you here what is wrong. What is I'm not going to tell you what's wrong, what is not because it's it's it depends on you. What I'm telling you here, what's the possible thing you can do? You can work with one. You can work with five. You can just uh, one of my research was like uh, the 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 scientist from the Switzerland has made a uh, research regarding the uh, the serotonin. Here in Turkey, we have done the dopamine. You have, so if you have enough background information, you know that serotonin and dopamine are related to neurodegenerative diseases. So you can go with these things. I, I hope I answered you uh, in a good way. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for the participation. Uh, Omar, can you please close the screen share so that we can take a picture for our website? Please, anyone who is available to open his camera, let's all take a picture for the memory of this. Thank you so much for participation. We wait you again for in another webinar. See you.